Okay, so the complex cellular membrane. So this is actually what the, the, the membrane of a cell looks like when it's made really, really simple in cartoon form. <laughs> so uh, researchers have identified thousands, actually 40,000 different lipids now have been identified in cell membranes. Not just one. Every protocell experiment, they use one type of lipid. Actually, a cell is made up of thousands of different types. And, and uh, um, mixtures of monoacial lipids destabilize the system. So when they have their monoacial lipids, those will destabilize the systems. You can't use those. Lipid bilayers surround subcellular organelles, such as nuclei and mitochondria, which are themselves microsystem assemblies. Each of these has their own lipid composition. So this is a lipid bilayer. You have some pointing out toward water, some pointing in toward the water on the interior of the cell. And the outside ones are different than the inside ones. Nobody knows how that was done. Nobody knows. Clueless. Nobody knows how that was done. Every protocell experiment just uses homogeneity throughout the whole thing. And so, so, so it, it doesn't, doesn't, it's not really a protocell. It's not really reminiscent of a cell. Now, within each one of those, you have other organelles like nuclei and mitochondria that have their own bilayer assemblies with their own constitution different than what's on the outside of the cell. Nobody knows how that was done. Plus, these have these proteins. So there's this, this, this non-symmetric distribution. Then there's proteins that go through here. These are ionophores. That allows certain things into the cell and certain things out. Without that, you can't let anything into the cell. It's going to kill the cell. There's a, it has very discrete sensors that allow certain molecules to get in, certain other molecules to get out. It has ionophores that allow certain ions in, certain ions out to keep the ionic concentration at, 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 at a certain level for maintenance of that cell. As soon as that ionic concentration gets off, you know what happens? Boom! The cell explodes because the ionic concentration has gotten off. It blebs and explodes. Nobody knows how that is done. None of the protocell experiments, none of them have these proteins going through them as these control gateways. Then, then there's also lipid bilayers have a vast number of carbohydrate appendages. So all, off of these, this is a carbohydrate appendage. It's called a glycan. The artist is just showing us a few of these. A cell is covered with these. This is how cells recognize each other. How does one cell recognize another cell? By these carbohydrate assemblies that they recognize each other. They have these recognition patterns. And so you can tell one cell from another. And so... If you just take nucleotides, if you just take DNA, DNA, oh, DNA is so complex and it has so much information. Look, if you have six A bases, A, 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 how can you arrange those? What are the different ways you can arrange it? Just that one, A, 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 that's it. It's one way you can arrange six bases. Look at carbohydrates. If you just take the carbohydrate D-pyranose, just a standard carbohydrate, just D-pyranose, you have six of those has over one trillion ways it can assemble. One trillion ways it can assemble, just with six of them. These have much more than six. And if it's not assembled right, guess what? The cell dies. You change any one of the carbohydrates, it re results in cell death. There is much more information stored in carbohydrate assembly than in DNA. Yeah. Much more information can be stored in carbohydrates. You want to build a massive computer? Build it based on carbohydrate assembly. Much better than DNA assembly. It's just a carbohydrate assembly is really hard to control. Nobody knows how to control this. Nobody. But somehow, on a prebiotic earth, with nobody around, under a rock, <laughs> it figured this out. How do origin of life researchers address this problem? They don't. They don't. Next slide. Interactomes. This is the non-covalent interactions th that function within a cell. Nobody knows how a viable cell emerges from massive combinatorial complexity of its molecular components. And of course, nobody's ever synthetically mimicked it. An interactome is the whole set of molecular interactions in a particular cell. If one merely considers protein-protein interaction combinations in just a single yeast cell, the result is an estimated 10 to the 79 uh, billion combinations. That's estimated by the, these folks at Johns Hopkins and, and Brussels, all right? That's not my estimation. These are, the, 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 these are uh, uh, um, biophysicists, all right? 
So just to give you an, uh, an idea of how big that number is, that's 10 to the 90th is the number of elemental particles in the universe. That's 10 to the 90th. This is 10 to the 79 billion. That's a big, big number. <laughs> People do not understand numbers. They just don't. You say a million dollars, a billion dollars, what's the difference? A million dollars or a billion dollars? Well, let me put it in a way that you understand. A million seconds is 11 days. So you ask somebody, will you marry me? I'll tell you in a million seconds. Okay. If they say a billion seconds, that's 32 years. All right? You feel that now? A million to a billion? And then if they say a trillion seconds... That's 32,000 years. Huh? You see the difference when you go up three orders of magnitude? You go a million, 10 to the 6th, to 10 to the 9th, to 10 to the 12th. That's 10 to the 79 billion. <laughs> that number's crazy big. That's just in a single yeast cell, the interactions between the non-bonded interactions. So how does the inf information flow? Information flows through non-bonded interactions through electrostatic potentials, which physicists call a virtual photon. Information goes down these at the speed of light. That depends on ordering between molecules, non-covalent interactions. These have to be all kind of assembled right, and that's why this information, you don't dehydrate cells and rehydrate them and get them to work properly. When a cell divides, it collapses down, puts the information on both halves, and brings it into both sides. So that that information keeps going to the next and the next generation. Because when you lose these intermolecular interactions that are non-covalent, non-attached, you've lost your information flow. Big problem. Nobody has explained. Nobody, nobody in Origin of Life ever mentions the word interactomes. Never will you hear it in their literature. Next slide. Proto-turkeys. Origin of life protocell assembly is akin to buying 20 pounds of sliced turkey meat, adding a gallon of turkey broth, warming, sticking a few feathers, and suggesting that a live turkey will eventually come gobbling out. <laughs> if given enough time, or that a proto-turkey or extant turkey has been synthesized. <laughs> this is exactly what is done in origin of life experiments. It's exactly what is done. If given enough time, a turkey's going to come out. <laughs> and people buy this stuff. There's a whole area of research called origin of life research, and they've been doing this same thing since 1952. Next slide. Critical for life is the origin of information, DNA or RNA. The information is primary and the matter is secondary. We can't even get the matter, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, lipids, proteins, let alone the information. What is the code? Even if you had the nucleic acids and even if you could hook them up, what's the code? Where do you get that code? So we heard a little bit about this uh, 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 earlier in, 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 this, in this conference. The information is primary. That's the information. It can be stored on all sorts of mediums. So, so I have an idea and then, then I transcribe this onto a piece of paper. And now it's on the paper. And then I type this into my, my computer and it goes into, in, in, into uh, DRAM. And then when I hit save, it goes into flash memory. And then when I upload it to the web, that same information now is going through an RF wave into a box on the wall. And then from that box on the wall, it's going through a wire to some server farm someplace where it goes right back down into transistor-based flash memory. That same information, which was here in my hand to the paper, in my computer in several different forms, in, in an RF wave, same information, different medium. The information is primary. The medium can change all the time. So, for example, the molecules in our bodies are always changing. It used to be said that the molecules in our bodies turn over are changed every seven years. And that's a bunch of nonsense. They're changed continually. It's much less than seven years. And some guys wrote, well, the molecules in your teeth aren't changed. And then I sent them, just, I did one second Google search. I mean, your teeth are constantly, you get dissolution, redeposition, constantly changing. Every molecule in your body is undergoing a proton exchange. Pro uh, proton comes with a spin up, a proton comes with a spin down. Every one of these now is a different molecule in the sense that it has different atoms that, that, that make it up. 
Maybe the same pattern of atoms, but a different atom. You had a different proton exchange. Every molecule is continuing to change. We are dynamic structures constantly changing. What is the real me? I don't know what the real me is. If you want to say it's the matter is the real me, then you got a big problem because it's constantly changing. This is what we were talking about earlier, the difference between brain and mind. What is the real me? Next slide. You try to build a cell, even hypothetically, get the dream team, get the smartest people together. Can they build a living cell? I'll give you all, all the chemicals you want in homochiral form. And I'll give you even the informational code. I'll give you the whole code. In other words, you tell me how you want the DNA set up. I'll give it all to you. Now just assemble a cell. Go ahead. You got all your diacetyl lipids all in chiral form. Make your protocell. Make it. Put in your peptides any way you want. Set it up. Get your carbohydrates out there. I'll even hook the carbohydrates together. You just tell me the pattern you want. Then you got to stick them on your cell. Can you do it? No. Nobody can. Nobody. Nobody's ever done it. Nobody can do it. That's not to say it won't ever be done. I'm just telling you, as of today, it hasn't been done, and it's far, far away from being able to do it. People will quote to me this, synthetic cells. Well, in 2010, Craig Venter's group copied an existing bacterial genome and trans transplanted it into another cell. So, what happens? I buy, I buy, say, a Corvette. And so what do I do? I take, I take the computer control box out of that Corvette, and I go to my clean room at the university, and I copy the chips. I copy them. And I put my chips that I copied into that control box, and I go back and I stick that in my Corvette. And I say, I built that Corvette. <laughs> I made that Corvette. I, I did that. You just copied the same chip and you put it back in. That's all he did. He took another one in 2016, and he, he did something similar, <clears throat> but he, he took the control box and he knocked out all but 473 of the working devices and he stuck it back in the cell and like, whoa, <laughs> you made a cell. No, he didn't. You just made a cell worse. <laughs> you just chopped out a bunch of stuff and left just a few pieces to keep it operating enough. He didn't make the cell. There's all this complexity, all these interactums. Nobody ever made that. Nobody knows how to do it. 